There's a passage in the canon where a young monk is being asked by a king why you're ordained. After all, the young monk came from a wealthy family. His health was good. His relatives were all alive. Why would he ordain? And the monk said that one of the reasons was because he could see the truth in the fact that all the world was a slave to craving. And he wanted to get out of that slavery. He gave an example of the king. Suppose someone were to come and say there's a kingdom to the east that has lots of wealth, lots of people, but a very weak army. Your army is strong enough to beat the army and seize that kingdom. Would you take it? And here the king is 80 years old, and the king would say yes. Suppose another person would come from the south with the same message. Another person from the west, another from the north, another person from across the ocean, saying there's a kingdom across the ocean that you could conquer. Lots of wealth, lots of people. Would you go for it? The king says yes. The young monk said, that's what I mean when I say the world is a slave to craving. There's another passage where the Buddha said, even if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't have enough for one, one person's sensual desires, enough to satisfy those desires. And so the monk wanted to get out of that slavery. Now, there are two ways of approaching that. One is just to deny desire. To tell yourself, I don't want anything. But that's not the Buddha's way. His way was to find something that was such a total happiness that it satisfied all possible desires. Something outside of space and time would not be touched by changes in space and time. So it solved the problem of desire. But to get there requires desire. All phenomena, the Buddha said, are rooted in desire. It means all things good, all things bad. Everything except nirvana is rooted in desire. Everything you experience is shaped by your desires. The mind is not a passive thing. It's active. It goes out looking for things, looking for food, looking for clothing, shelter, looking for happiness. And so what we're doing as we practice is we take that fact and we direct it in a good way. There's a passage where a Brahmin is coming to see Ananda, who was one of the Buddha's disciples, and says, this path that you follow, what's one of its, what are its goals? And Ananda says, one of the goals is to free the mind from desire. And then the Brahmin asks, how do you do that? And then it says one of the ways of doing it is to develop concentration based on desire and the development of right effort. And the Brahman says, wait a minute, how can you use desire to get rid of desire? It would be an endless path. And then it gives him an analogy. He says, you came here to visit me in the park. Before you came here, did you have the desire to come here? Yes. And when you came here, what motivated you? Was it the desire? Yes. Now that you're here at the park, where is the desire? Well, the desire has been satisfied. So there's no more desire there. That, Ananda said, is how you should understand this. And we look at the path. The Buddha gives an image of a, of a raft to take you across a river tie together twigs and leaves and branches, and then you paddle your way across. The paddling is your effort, but you have to hold on to the path. But notice that path is made out of twigs and leaves and branches. The Buddha did not give the image of a yacht 
taking you across the river. You take things that you already have in your mind, and you put, together, put them together in the right way, and they can help you get across. Then when you've got to the other side, then you don't need them anymore. And among those twigs and leaves and branches is the desire that motivates right effort. And you begin to notice that some of your thoughts, some of the qualities of your mind lead to happiness. You want to develop them. If they're not there, you want to give rise to them. If you already got them, then you want to develop them even further. As for unskillful qualities, and based on greed, aversion, and delusion, you see that if you follow them, they take you in a direction you don't want to go. So if they're there, you want to get abandon them. And if they're not there, you want to prevent them from arising. So there is desire. It's an important part of the path. And this faculty of right effort then underlies right mindfulness. Like we're practicing right now, trying to get the mind into concentration by being very mindful of the breath, the breath in and of itself. You don't have to want to focus on the breath and to want to put aside any thoughts that would pull you away. The Buddha recommends three qualities that help with this. One is mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. Alertness, the ability to know what you're doing while you're doing it. And then ardency. Now, ardency is basically right effort again, and part of right effort, of course, is desire. And so you remember when something comes up that would pull you away from the breath, you have to want to come back. You remember to come back, and you remember whatever techniques have worked. Sometimes when you've wandered away, all you have to do is notice the fact that you've wandered away and you come back. Other times you have to remind yourself of the drawbacks of the thinking that would pull you away. At the very least, this is not the time for that kind of thinking. More with heavier cases involving greed, aversion, and delusion, you want to see that at any time getting involved in that kind of thinking is not going to be useful. Or you may decide that you simply don't want to pay attention to that. This is where thinking of the mind as a committee is useful. Some of the committee members may have some opinions, but you don't have to listen to everybody in the committee. You don't have to identify with everyone in the committee. So if they're going to chatter around about what they want, that's their business. You're going to stay focused on the breath. The thinking of the mind does not destroy the breath. It's there. All you have to do is to remember to stay focused here, or you begin to notice that when you're really sensitive to the breath energy in the body, that when a thought comes into the mind, there will be a little pattern of tension that is associated with that thought someplace in the body. It might be in the arms and the feet, around your forehead, around the eyes. They can be anywhere. And if you sense that as soon as the thought comes in, there's a pattern of tension someplace in the body, you relax it. Breathe right through it. that thought will go away. If it doesn't go away, just make up your mind you're not going to let that thought come into the mind. This is where having a meditation word is useful. You can repeat it really fast, like bhutto, which means awake. Just repeat that word again and again. It's like jamming the signals. This of all the methods for keeping the mind from wandering off requires the most desire and the strongest determination the least discernment. But if you think of these different methods as different tools you have in your toolbox, this is like the sledgehammer. Sometimes you need a sledgehammer. But the important part is that you're ardent in doing this. You give it your whole heart. You realize that instead of being slave to your desires, you want to take some control. You want your discernment, your wisdom to be in charge of what you want. 
because what you want is going to shape everything you experience. And if you direct your wants in the right direction, it can take you to a place where the wants are satisfied. When the Buddha talks about nirvana, he describes it as the highest happiness, peace, freedom, a consciousness without any limitations at all. Something that's true and unchanging. Something totally free from hunger, free from lack. So the Buddha is not trying to deny desire, or to have you try to deny desire. He's basically saying that it is possible to put your desires in order, straighten them out, tie them together and make them into a raft that takes you over the flood of desire to the far shore. Once you get there, then you can put the raft aside. But while you're crossing over the river, don't let go. Try to identify which desires in your mind are the most trustworthy ones, the ones that open the most possibility for a genuine happiness. And don't let other desires push them aside. Make sure that they're front and center, and this way you give the Buddha's teachings a chance. As he said, he can't show nirvana to anybody. All he can do is describe it as a possibility, as a desirable possibility. And he leaves it up to each of us to prove whether he's right or not. So through your meditation, through your practice of virtue and concentration discernment, try to make yourself worthy of judging to see if what the Buddha said is really true. That desire can be used to put an end to desire, and to free you from this slavery to craving that otherwise drives the world so much.